If you may uh, open your Bibles in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. If you have it, say amen. If you can see the screen with the big letters, amen too. And it reads, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, friend, who sent me to be judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. My friends, the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask that as we go into your word, into your message, that you may speak a word of comfort, a word of courage, and a word of promise. Speak, Holy Spirit, for we are all listening. Amen. Today we will be talking about parables. As you might remember, this fellow Jesus really liked to talk in parables. The stories that are unforgettable. The story is so simple, yet deep enough to spend years discussing its true meaning. And it is my hope that you never forget this parable. And so it happens that there are two brothers. One of them asks Jesus to settle a dispute about an inheritance. Something interesting to note is that in those times, a father was the only one who could settle those disputes. The father was the authority to settle the inheritance, not a rabbi. But here we are, an out of the ordinary request. And so Jesus replies, dude, what do you want from me? Who do you think I am? I'm not your dad. Estás loco. That means, are you crazy? But I believe that Jesus has an answer for everything. And uh, so for Jesus to say, what do you want from me? It's kind of out of character for him. In discussing the inheritance, Jesus doesn't warn against money, wealth, or material abundance. It's actually not about the bling bling, the Benjamins, or show me the money. Instead, he warns against greed of any kind, about the insatiable feeling of never having enough. To illustrate his teaching, he tells a story of a man who had a successful crop. It is safe to say that many of us are not farmers, but we can still identify with this person. Sometimes we experience better years than others. Maybe we do well in the stock market, in the stock market 
or we get a raise. That's what happened to the farmer. He just had a great year. The farmer's problem is not that he's rich or that he got a raise or that he wants to plan for the future. The farmer's problem is that his good fortune has altered his vision so that everything he sees starts and ends with him. This attitude is what Jesus warns against. The farmer was so astonished of, at the great amount of the grain he had gathered that he asked himself, what should I do? And then he has great ideas of tearing down his barns and building bigger ones. But here, is, here we find one of the saddest conversations that there are. Listen again. The conversation he has with himself, not a spouse, or a friend, or a parent, or a neighbor, or a dog, or a cat, but only for himself. I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store my grain and my goods, and I will tell my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid out for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Can you see how this person is centered in me, me, me? This conversation is about me, myself, and I. Also, don't you think it's sad that this person only has himself to talk to? Then after he has stored all of his crops in his newly renovated barns, what does he say he will do? And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid out for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Relaxation only happens after we have completed a task when something we put our mind and strength comes together and it is finalized and, and we say in the words of Jesus, it is finished, it is done, finito. I want to ask you a question and don't be ashamed to raise your hand, okay? Well, we, we are family right here. Do you have a honey-do list? Honey, do this. Honey, please do that. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being transparent with me. <clears throat> and, you know, when I'm finished with that list, I am, I am relieved. I'm happy, and, and, say, and I say I can relax now. I can relax, eat, drink a Pepsi, and be merry. Likewise, this happens in church. As we set out to do a specific ministry together, we touch lives, we become the means of the Holy Spirit, the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. People are changed and transformed. Lives that had a faint heartbeat are now the heartbeat of a community. I think that's wonderful. We do a great job here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I even dare to say that we have done more than enough. We should sit back and be on autopilot. Actually, we could just close our doors and say, Annandale United Methodist Church, you have ample goods. So sit back, relax, eat, drink, be merry. But the reality is that there's a bunch of people outside. People hurting, people needing our help, asking for questions nobody has an answer, looking for a community to welcome them, looking, searching for a meaning in their lives. In the parable, the rich man's words to himself express 
his decision to continue on his present course of accumulating more resources without sharing them with others. His expectation is that his comfortable life live without the thought of suffering of others will continue. He has fallen prey to the notion that life, and particularly the good life, is defined by money and possessions and more and more of it. And you might ask, how can we avoid falling into that or how do I fix it? So say it with me. How do I fix it? How do I fix it? Okay, one again. How do I fix it? I don't know. <clears throat> well, for starters, a sermon will not give you the answers. But it can get us started toward a different way of living and being and relating to each other and to God. Here are three suggestions. Number one, <clears throat> start the conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Number one, start the conversation. Believe it or not, we don't talk about money in the church. We talk about the church budget. We talk about good stewardship. We talk about many other things. Lent mission project. But we rarely talk about how money controls every decision in our lives. <clears throat> or how we often depend on money more than God. Money is too important to ignore. And if we remain silent as a church, then the culture of voices about money, greed, and consumption become the only ones we will hear. Number two, practice naming your blessings. The elements of abundant life that Jesus describes throughout the Gospels, like relationships, community, love, purpose, may be less tangible, but they are also a lot more powerful than material goods. And each of us can experience them every day. The joy of a good conversation, the sense of purpose that comes from helping another person, the warmth of a loving relationship, the feeling of a community that gathers to praise God, friends, family, the awareness of how many ways we are blessed each and every day. These things are palpably and powerfully available to us. But an entire media universe pushes us to tune into what is negative or what is missing, rather what is positive and is right within reach. Our practices shape our beliefs and attitudes. So I invite you to practice naming your blessings. We can't buy happiness, but we are all certainly rich in blessings. Number three, develop a community of support Living into the abundant life Jesus promises is incredibly hard. It is hard. And almost impossible to do it alone. Appreciating our blessings becomes even harder. Given how our culture and media highlights our shortcomings in order to sell us solutions. So join a small group to start having this conversation about the pitfalls of consumption. If you are already in a small group, make sure that you're not only talking about your soul, but also talk about the spiritual effects of idolizing money. My friends, let us remember that the problem is not about the money, but about our attitude toward money. The attitude to think that I have done so well that I can now relax and stop looking to the needs of others. In Luke chapter 10, verse 2, we find that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. God's honey-do list for each us, for each one of us, and Annandale United Methodist Church, is not complete. There is still much to be done to pay forward for our blessings. 
Let us not rest in our laurels, stop piling our treasures and possessions, but live richly every day with God and others as our priority. So I leave you with this thought. Do you own money or does money own you? How you answer will either make you out to be a fool or a fool for Christ. Which one do you want to be?